So today we are going to be talking about VBAC after three or more cesareans. This is a topic that is close to my heart because of the fact that a lot of my friends have been told over and over that they weren't allowed to have their baby vaginally. Oftentimes they'd have one or more cesareans and then their doctor would basically say to them, you've had too many C-sections, you can't try a vaginal birth. And this is something that I see a lot with my clients. This is something I see in the mom groups. This is something I saw recently inside of a discussion on an article about how many C-sections are you allowed to have, as if that's the only option. It's incredibly frustrating, first of all, that a lot of our care providers will say to us that we aren't allowed to birth our babies vaginally. Because first of all, what happens if we don't introduce surgery is that a baby will eventually be born vaginally. That's the default exit. So one thing I always tell my clients, especially when they're saying, well, my doctor is telling me that I'm not allowed to give birth after 39 weeks, that I have to schedule a C-section. I'm like, okay, so what, what happens if you don't schedule that C-section? Eventually, your body is going to go into labor. Your doctor forgets that the default exit for a baby is through the vagina. Our bodies are going to do it anyway. Our bodies are going to go into labor. That's what we're designed to do. Unfortunately, a lot of the practices that have come down from maternity care over the past several decades, they don't come from evidence and they don't really come from the idea that our bodies work. In fact, a lot of the history and her story of maternity care is based on the idea that our bodies are defective machines. And there was a lot of misogyny around it. And as you see, I've got a new book in my collection, um, Reclaiming Childbirth as a Rite of Passage. Now you have a nice shiny copy to see right here. This is the one that you want. This is the one I've been talking about. And I have it on Kindle and now I have it in hard copy. But the thing about this book is that it also goes into the history and the her story of why our maternity care system is so messed up. So first of all, I'm going to share about the stats and the risks and benefits based on an article that was written by Jen Kamel in VBAC Facts. You can look in our discussion of this Facebook group, or if you are watching on YouTube, I will be dropping the link inside of the discussion as well. Or you can go to bebackfacts.com and it's one of the more recent articles that she, had, that she has uh, posted. It's basically on what the evidence says about VBAC after three or more cesareans. So she goes into great detail with this and it can be quite daunting for someone especially as a parent who has no medical knowledge whatsoever to sit there and read that entire article so if you're one of the people who likes to go and look back at the actual information that article will be there for you you can go and check it out inside the facebook group facebook.com forward slash group slash empowering mom's birth I will also be putting that inside of the chat of this video. And you can always check out vbacfacts.com. And another good site is Evidence-Based Birth. Rebecca Decker and Jen Kamel have done extensive research and they've poured over all of the different studies and they break down what is the actual numbers are. Because oftentimes, if you go to your doctor and discuss the risks of VBAC, they won't tell you the truth. They will tell you that the risks increase or the risks double or that it goes up and it is from multiple C-sections, those risks are higher than if you only have one. But they're not giving you the actual numbers. And today, I'm going to give you the actual numbers because I believe in transparency above all else. Now, it's true that the numbers do go up as you have more C-sections. Obviously, that makes sense. However, it's really not that big of a deal as they make it seem to be. The numbers aren't actually that high, and you're going to find out that in a minute. I'm also going to share with you a story of a friend of mine who had a vaginal birth after three cesareans. This is my friend Wendy, and she was an older mom, 
She'd had three C-sections before. The first one was because of an induction that failed because she was a 42 week mama and she wasn't ready yet, but she didn't know this until she really started diving into the research. So I'm going to share that. Then I'm also going to share with you what I tell my clients when it comes to planning a vaginal birth after three cesareans, especially in this maternity care system. And sometimes we have to go outside of what the box tells us to do. Okay. So I did take notes this time because there was so much in that article and I just want to make sure that I have all of the facts straight for you so that you can go in and again, you can fact check at vbackfacts.com. So the first one, how much information do we really have about vaginal birth after three cesareans? The answer is going to shock you. Not much. We don't really have a lot of really good studies. In fact, the largest study that we've actually had on vaginal birth after multiple cesareans happened in 1994. Now, for me, that doesn't seem very long ago, and I'm dating myself here, but when I see 1990s, I'm like, oh, that's not that long ago, but it really is because it's over 20 years old. <sighs> Take a deep breath for a minute. Um, that that's that's sometimes hard to swallow especially if you're in your 30s or 40s but the fact is that yes that study was done over 20 years ago and the number of people in that study was only 241. now in order to have a really good study you want thousands of participants you don't want only 200 that's not representative of a population so when i was doing research in in college and understanding about how research is conducted and what sample sizes are. Like I can tell already that this is a very small sample size, but even in that very small sample size, this is the largest study that we have is the one 241. So the other thing you need to know is that this study, most of the other ones were combined. So they're combined with VBAC for multiple cesarean, they're combined with VBAC 3C and they're combined with VBAC 2C. And there's a difference between a VBAC 2C and a VBAC 3C and a VBAC multiple C. And we don't have a lot of variations in what the risk factors were. And we don't know if some of these were induced or if they had membrane sweeps or if they had any interventions. It does not say in these studies. So that's one thing you really want to be aware of is that they're actually conducting these studies also in a hospital. And we know that hospital birth is not necessarily going to be physiological. In fact, oftentimes hospitals make the physiological process harder because of all of their interventions and just walking into the room and hovering can also interfere with our emotional state, which in turn interferes with our physiological process. If you want to learn more about that, reclaiming childbirth as a rite of passage, I just read the chapter on liminality. So what are the risks of a repeat C-section? Because oftentimes your doctor will just tell you what the risks are of a vaginal birth after multiple cesareans. And they'll say, oh, well, the uterine rupture risk, blah, 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 or, or they'll scare you or they'll try to make it seem like it's really, really risky. But there are risks to repeat C-sections and oftentimes these are not discussed. So let's discuss them, shall we? Okay, so for one thing, C-sections can have common minor complications. They can have issues with healing, they can have issues with your milk not coming in properly. It can just be more pain associated with them, longer recovery. I mean, all of those things are common. Another one is adhesions, which is the scar tissue building up in your uterus that can also attach to different organs. And this can happen even in an uncomplicated C-section, which happened to my friend, Christine. If you wanna know more about Christine's story, I did put that inside of our archives for our guide section in our videos. She is the mom who had the home birth after cesarean, and it was a surprise home birth 
because she wasn't actually planning on having her baby at home. But at the last second, she decided when her midwife said that they still had time to transfer to the hospital, she said, do I need to get on the bed? The midwife said, yes, it's policy. And Christine said, yeah, 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 no, there's no way I'm getting on that bed. So Christine's story, she had dense adhesions with her first C-section. And then with her second vaginal birth, like she still has those complications. So that is always a chance of that happening with a C-section, even if it's completely uncomplicated, even with a first C-section. But the other one is there can be life-threatening complications with the more C-sections that you have, such as excessive bleeding, blood clots, injury to the organs, which is also something that can happen with a first C-section, injury to the baby. I've seen incidences where babies have been cut even across the face there was one baby that had her her face like basically a whole line down her face it was terrible terrible thing to happen um future risk of abnormal placenta this is another one that's really big there's placenta previa which is when the placenta covers the cervix and then there's placenta accreta which is really dangerous because the placenta is now growing into the uterine tissue. That is when you are going to be planning a C-section just because you can't do anything with that. Like that is going to cause serious problems. That can cause hemorrhaging. That is a complication. And it can happen after a first C-section. It can also happen if you have other damage to your uterus but this is more common the more C-sections that you have. But let's assume for a minute that you are pregnant again. This is your fourth baby. You've had three C-sections. You don't have placenta accreta. You don't have placenta previa. And you seem to be having a perfectly normal, healthy pregnancy. So here's the thing about being able to plan a C-section when you don't have these other complications. If you're having a vaginal birth after two cesareans, your chances of a hysterectomy are 0.9% or, or one in 111. Sorry. So one in 111, there's a lot of one, one, ones there for a hyster hysterectomy as a result of basically you're excessively bleeding. So they have to take out your uterus in order to save you. If you have a fourth C-section, that increases. So instead of 0.9%, that risk goes up to 2.41%. That means that instead of one in 111 chances of having a hysterectomy with a repeat C-section, if you're going for a, three, a fourth C-section and not going for a vaginal birth after three C-sections, but having another C-section, your chances of hysterectomy as a result is one in 41. That's pretty scary. And yet, oftentimes, doctors don't even say that. They tell you, well, you've had three C-sections, it's more dangerous for you to have a VBAC, so we're just gonna do a repeat surgery. But you have a one in 41 chance of losing your uterus as a result of that. That doesn't seem right at all, does it? So, next one, because of excessive blood loss, you may also need a blood transfusion. So if you're having your third C-section, that's one in 130 for a chance. And if you are having your fourth C-section, one in 63. So again, your chances of having to have a hysterectomy or blood transfusion are gonna be higher if you're going for another repeat C-section than if you're trying for a VBAC after three C-sections. Placenta accreta, now this is another one, if you want more than four kids and you're thinking, this isn't my last one, I want to have another baby after this, but my doctor's pushing a C-section. Your placenta accreta chance, if you have had two C-sections already, and then you're, um, then basically you are going with a one in 175 for a three, for a third C-section. So if you have already got two C-sections underway and you're planning a VBAC after two C-sections, then, and you want to have more kids, 
then you're probably not going to want to risk placenta accreta because that is again a chance that you're probably going to need a c-section because of the fact that this is a serious complication and it's one in 175. Now, if you're at your third C-section and you're going for your fourth C-section and you want to have another child after that, your risk is now one in 47. So again, placenta accreta risks are so much higher as you keep having more C-sections. Now, I will also add that the rates were among planned unnecessary repeat C-sections. So a lot of the time, these moms had had planned unnecessary cesareans for reasons such as big baby, or maybe they were told that they had to have a repeat C-section because they don't do VBAC in that hospital. So this is not a group where they had high complications. So the high rates of complications when there were medical reasons, so after one or two C-sections, VBAC had the lowest rate of complications. So if you have had one or two cesareans, your lowest chance of having complications after your birth are if you have had a vaginal birth after one or, more, or, one or two cesareans. Now, then your risk of complication goes up if you have another C-section, making it number three or number four. And then if you're having cesarean after cesarean after cesarean, basically not anticipated. The planned cesarean, of course, is for complications. Um, obviously, if you have a plan for a VBAC and you have a complication, then that's the time to visit whether or not you want to plan a repeat C-section. But if there are no complications and then something develops, and you have another emergency C-section, the complications had the highest. So again, you have to take those numbers and think, well, what happened to make it a planned cesarean? And what happened to make it a CBAC, a cesarean birth after cesarean? Which is when you are attempting a VBAC, but you end up in a cesarean, it's called a CBAC. So what do the studies say? All right, so, if you're wanting to know what your actual chances of having a cesarean versus a VBAC are when you're planning for a VBAC after one cesarean or two cesareans or three cesareans, instead of going by that ridiculous VBAC calculator that always, always makes you feel undermined and that your body doesn't work because of the way that they do it, and if you have certain um, attributes, like you're older, or you've had more than one C-section, or you have a certain body mass index, or you're a certain race, like all of these things, they put into that stupid VBAC calculator, and it means absolutely nothing. And yet they still do it. Why? Because anybody who is using a VBAC calculator on you is not VBAC supportive. They're VBAC tolerant. That means that they're saying, oh yeah, sure, we do VBAC. And in their head, they're going, yeah. And then um, we're, we're just gonna give you a C-section. We're gonna undermine your confidence and we're going to give you a C-section because we really don't actually do VBAC. So the only way you can actually do VBAC with us as care providers is if you miraculously go into labor before 39 weeks and you miraculously manage to have a baby under our fake growth diagnosis and you miraculously get to the hospital and you're already eight centimeters and we just don't have time to prep the OR. Otherwise, you're getting a C-section. That's what VBAC tolerant really means. And it is terrifying. And unfortunately, this is what our culture has built around this fear of VBAC and the lack of support with VBAC. But if you have a VBAC supportive care provider, they're not going to do that. They're not going to use the VBAC calculator on you. All right, so that large study that I talked about at the beginning about the 241 months who went into this study for vaginal birth, they figured out what the odds were based on this study of how many people actually were successful of having a vaginal birth. So planned vaginal birth after three cesareans, 79% 
of the moms who had planned a vaginal birth after three cesareans had one. And remember, this is in the hospital. They weren't doing home birth studies. They very rarely do home birth studies because home birth people don't usually want to be having their, uh, their births studied and randomized controls and all of that stuff. We don't want that. We want to have our own autonomy. So these were hospital studies. They probably had it very controlled. At that time in 1994, there also wasn't a huge thing of induction and they were more likely to agree to vaginal birth after cesarean and support that because they were starting to see that once a cesarean, always a cesarean wasn't coming up. It wasn't, it wasn't a good thing. So they really did push for VBAC back then. In fact, I remember my aunt having her baby after one cesarean and it was just nothing. Like she didn't have to jump through any hoops. It was just assumed that she would have this next one vaginally. So you're wondering probably if the vaginal birth rate after three cesareans was 79%, what is it after one? Well, after one, it's 83%. So that means that the discrepancy between a vaginal birth after three cesareans and a vaginal birth after only one cesarean, it's really not that big of a difference. It's less than 5% difference because you've got 79 minus 83. And then a vaginal birth after two cesareans, it was 75%. So I'm not exactly sure why the VBAC after three cesareans is different than a VBAC after two cesareans. Maybe it had something to do with the way that things were managed. Maybe it was something to do with what complications might have developed. But still, you have about a 75% chance of having a vaginal birth. And I can tell you right now that is much, much higher to ha have a vaginal birth if you have a care provider who's supportive or you're understanding the physiological birth process and you know that you're naturally going to need more time to labor. Remember, even if you've had cesarean after cesarean after cesarean, when you go into labor, if you never went into physiological labor before, if you had had an induced labor, your body is going into labor for the first time for real. Your body is doing the work for the first time for real. So you can still treat yourself as a first time mom who may take longer and that's okay. And the thing is that if you did go into labor and you ended up with a cesarean and it was because of failure to progress, that just might mean that your body just needed more time to warm up. Again, Reclaiming Childbirth as a Rite of Passage is an excellent book for learning about physiological birth, and I highly recommend it. Uh, Rachel Reed also has another book, Why Induction Matters. If you were induced, you may want to read that one as well. In now, you're probably wondering about that scary uterine rupture rate, because if 79% of moms had a VBAC, for a vaginal birth after three cesareans, and they actually got one, how many had a uterine rupture? Oh no, the uterine rupture rate, oh dear. Out of 241 people, that's, that's like a whole study on VBAC, 1.2%. 1.2%, and remember, this was a very small study. Now, you also need to know, no babies died. No babies died in that study. No moms died. It was just a uterine rupture and they, they caught it and the moms were fine. The babies were fine. Nobody died. So that, that was the biggest study. Now, you're probably wondering about the other studies. So there was one in 2010. So if your doctor tries to say, well, there was a study in 2010, um, there were 89 participants. So if they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes and say, well, there was a, an updated study that was in 2010 about this and said this, there was 89 people. There was one in 2003 that had four. And there was one in 2006 and it had 104. So again, the largest study was done in 1994 and you now know the results. 
So what do the national guidelines say? Because oftentimes I will hear this where people will say, well, ACOG says this, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists says we can't do VBAC. No, they don't. And that is not what they say. Jen Kamel was quite clear. She says, ACOG says data regarding risks is limited. And they talked about vaginal birth after two cesareans and vaginal birth after three cesareans, but they didn't distinguish between them. So the thing is that the risks are limited and it would be an appropriate option because they don't really have any evidence to say this is too dangerous. They have only 241 participants in the study from 1994. And today, a lot of care providers, they just decide to do another C-section and a lot of moms, they don't know that they can say no to that. Because for the longest time, our culture was once a cesarean, always a cesarean. If you've had more than one cesarean, you're automatically getting a cesarean. It's too dangerous, VBAC, uterine rupture, uh, don't you care about your baby, all of that nonsense. But I have seen vaginal birth after two cesareans and I've seen vaginal birth after three cesareans. And Desiree, who I interviewed last week, she attended a birth where there was a vaginal birth after five cesareans. In fact, Jen Kamel actually goes into this in her article as well, that there was a doctor who was talking about how VBAC, even after five cesareans, was no big deal. So if you're curious, you can go and check out that article, and she actually has a video that you can watch about this interview with this doctor. Now, here's the problem. Will your care provider actually attend a vaginal birth after three cesareans? Because oftentimes this is what stops moms. This is what stops you from deciding that you're going to go for it. Because your care provider says, oh no, we don't do that. You can't have a VBAC. You absolutely, it's, it's too dangerous. There's too much chance of uterine rupture. You're too old, you're too fat, or, or whatever other stupid thing that they're going to say to try to tell you that you're higher, higher risk and that you have to have a repeat C-section. But remember what I said at the beginning about complications. You have a higher chance of hysterectomy. You have a higher chance of blood transfusion. You have a higher chance of placenta issues in the future. And it's just the fact that you're going through another surgery, you're going to have a longer recovery. You may have adhesions. It's just not going to be that natural birth where you get that natural birth high. And hey, Maybe you don't want another C-section. Maybe you've had your fill of C-sections and the thought of having another C-section just makes you feel so anxious inside and you just can't, you can't stand it. Well, guess what? Even if your doctor doesn't support you, the good news is the default exit for your baby is through your vagina. Eventually, if you don't schedule surgery, you will birth your baby. And this leads me into Wendy's story. So Wendy was this amazing mom who came to my first Improving Birth Rally that I had in the park in Abbotsford of my old community when I was standing there with Christine. It was just the two of us. We had set up a Facebook page. That page is still kind of active, kind of not. Um, I do have one admin on it if you're curious. It's uh, Improving Birth Abbotsford. But we started that page and people started to follow us, but we didn't have anybody attending our rally until Wendy showed up. And when Wendy showed up, she said, I just had a VBAC after three cesareans. And she had her baby on her hip. Her baby was just a few months younger than Hunter. And we were just so happy to have her and discuss with her because Wendy's so story is kind of a sad one. When she was younger and had her first baby, she was told that she wasn't going into labor on her own and she was induced. And that led to a C-section. And then for her second, she wanted to try a VBAC and she was excited about it, but she didn't know all her options and she didn't know that the doctor that she had chosen was bait and switching her. So at the very last part of her due date, uh, when she was getting close to 39 weeks, her doctor's like, hey, I just want to let you know I have an opening. We can schedule your surgery, and uh, that way I can make sure that this delivery happens while I'm while I'm here, because I'm going on vacation. And she's like, 
okay. Um, she assumed that she, the doctor knew what he was doing. So she agreed to that second C-section. With her third, it was an automatic, well, you've had two C-sections, so we're scheduling your third C-section. But then something happened. Wendy came across some information about vaginal birth after more than one cesarean. She started to learn about bait and switch. She started to learn about the fact that she was a 42 week mama and that that was normal for her body and she probably didn't need to be induced with that first labor. She also learned a lot about the actual risks of VBAC versus the risks of a repeat C-section. And she decided that if she was gonna get pregnant again, she was not going to have another C-section. So she studied and studied and studied and looked up all the information that she could. And this was back in 2013 and before that. And we didn't have as much information as we do now. We didn't have the VBAC facts that we have now. We didn't have a large social media presence at, at the point where we have it now. She didn't have much information. So she had to really dig for it. And when she found it, and she presented that to her care provider and said, look, I want to have a vaginal birth after three cesareans. Her care provider was not on board. None of them were. In fact, she went through the entire Fraser Health Authority with all of the doctors. And she was just like, I just want to birth my baby out of my vagina. Why is that so hard that they won't even let me go into labor? I don't get it. And they kept saying standard of care, standard of care, standard of care, standard of care. And she's like, I don't want standard of care. I want my care. I want to be supported so I can birth my baby the way I know I can. So Wendy had some support, but it wasn't from the medical community. It was from her doula and it was from her partner. And her partner, her husband, he was very much on board. He understood the pain that Wendy had gone through over the last several years, just thinking about, oh my God, I was tricked. I was put through the ringer. I had to do this induction. I had a C-section. I had another C-section. I had another C-section. I just wanted to birth my baby naturally. And they just put all that pressure on me and they just made me think that I was broken. And it turns out I wasn't broken. The system was broken and I'm not doing that again. And they're not making me do that again. And I'm going to fight. And so Wendy continued her search until she found outside of our health authority in the Vancouver area, a doctor who was part of the power to push campaign. And finally, this doctor said, okay, we will let you try for a VBAC. And she was so happy. And then her other care provider who wasn't too happy about it and had told her that she was too old, too fat, and had three C-sections, and even gave an analogy about, if you knew that your child climbing a tree and they fell out of that tree, there was a chance of them falling and breaking their leg, or it was a chance of them falling and dying, would you let them climb the tree? And Wendy was like, well, my kids climb trees all the time. So like, what are you saying? So when she heard that at first, she thought, oh good, they're gonna let me try only to hear, oh no, you don't let your kids climb the tree, even if it's just a small chance that something's gonna happen. You don't let them do it. And she's like, you're not talking my language, that's for sure. I've got uh, three kids, two boys and my daughter, and they all climb trees. And yeah, I, I can't follow you on this at all. I'm not bubble wrapping myself for a small chance. And now you know how small that risk actually is of uterine rupture, it's like, no, no, that's not happening. So Wendy then went to her appointment and was told that she couldn't have this uh, vaginal birth. And she's like, that's fine. I'm going with the power to push campaign and I'm going to do it. But her doctor had decided to schedule her C-section at 39 weeks without telling her. And then they called her up and they're like, where are you? And she's like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, you're supposed to be here for a C-section. It's like, I didn't order that. And she hung up. Wendy continued to wait for labor and she waited until 41 weeks and five days. And then she went into labor and she drove the hour and a half into the city 
so that she could go and birth at BC Women's. And when she arrived at BC Women's, the staff were very surprised to see her because they had also been notified by her other doctor that Wendy was not, in fact, going to be part of the Power to Push campaign. And then at one point during her labor, her sister was with her and her sister had been sort of on board but not on board and she didn't understand why it was so important to Wendy that she do this. Then her sister overheard somebody in the hallway, some medical staff say, she's not going to be able to do it. This is another C-section. And she walked right back into that room and she looked at Wendy and she's like, we're doing this. And the happy story is that Wendy ended up birthing her baby girl, her fourth child, completely naturally in the hospital at 41 weeks and five days. She had also had gestational diabetes. She was an older mom because she had three kids before that. She was of advanced maternal age and she was a higher body mass index. And she birthed her baby naturally at 41 weeks and five days after three C-sections. So anyone who tells you that you have to give birth by 39 weeks if you're planning a VBAC, they are VBAC tolerant, not VBAC supportive. If anybody says that because you're an older mom, you have to have a C-section, if anybody tells you that you have to be under a certain body mass index, they are VBAC tolerant. And if you also happen to have a care provider who tells you that because you have gestational diabetes, now you have to have a C-section, they are again, not VBAC supportive, they are VBAC tolerant. So what's the big takeaway here? Is Wendy did a few things that I always recommend to clients. First of all, she believed in herself more than the health authority believed in her. Even as they were telling her all of the scare tactics and trying to scare her with the uterine rupture rate, and then she would come back and say, yeah, but isn't that only like 1.2% out of a study of only 241 people? And every time that they tried to tell her that a repeat C-section was safer, and she's like, yeah, but isn't it possible that I could end up with a blood transfusion or hysterectomy, or I could end up with placenta accreta or if I wanted to have another child? And she just kept relaying those facts back to them and saying, look, no, I understand the risks and I'm choosing the risks of VBAC over the risks of a repeat C-section. That's what I'm choosing, that's my choice. She understood her rights. She understood that she had the right not only to informed consent, but informed refusal. She was declining the standard of care and that was okay because it was her body and her choice. But there is a lot of pushback that happens, especially in our health authority, and I've seen it everywhere. And it depends on which hospital and which doctor that you talk to. And a lot of them, if they don't think that they want to support VBAC, they're going to try to scare the crap out of you. So you need to feel that this is something you really want. You need to be perfectly clear that this is something you are willing to fight for. Not in the sense of violence, but in the sense of no matter what they say, you're going to tune into your own intuition and your own power, and you're not going to let anybody stop you. You're not going to let fear take over. You're not going to plan your birth from a place of fear, and you're not going to give in to their scare tactics. Another thing that Wendy did is she was willing to travel. Oftentimes, a lot of the cases that I've seen and the people I've talked to over the years, I asked them point blank, are you willing to travel? Because sometimes the hospital that is in your area is going to be the worst, absolute worst place for you. And if you are not comfortable birthing at home, especially an oops home birth or planned unassisted even, then you're going to want to be close to a hospital. But if you're willing to travel, I don't always recommend traveling in labor. It's a better idea, a better option, and this is something that Jenny and I have actually been discussing for a while, to rent a suite. Airbnbs, oftentimes, they have suites that they would also be willing to allow you to birth in because it's like a home environment. 
You could have a home birth at an Airbnb. You could also have a home birth at a birth house, which is a house that's run by midwives and often has more than one room. It's not a birth center, it's a birth house. So you're renting that space, which means that you basically have control, but the midwives are there to support you. Then there's birth centers. After that, there's hospitals. And you want to really research to find who is going to be VBAC supportive. But the thing is, Wendy was determined and she knew that she could birth her baby. In fact, after she birthed her fourth and we were talking, she said, if I ever do magically get pregnant again, it's going to be a home birth. I'm going to have a home birth. And that in itself, she understood that even that little bit of stress, even though she did it in the hospital, she got her back, her V back after three cesareans. The fact is that she was even more confident after that, my body works, I can do this, and she wanted to birth at home. She has four kids. She is not having any more babies. Her time is done with that, but she has given me permission to share her story with as many people as possible. She's stepped back from the birth community. She resigned a few years ago before I started empowering moms. The last event that we attended was the Birth Without Fear conference where I got this lovely book here that is also inscribed by J January herself. <laughs> and that was our last event. And now Wendy is doing her own thing, but she is an empowered mom for life. And if you ever have any questions, that you would like to ask Wendy. She's also given me permission to pass on her information so that you can talk to her. Anyway, the long story short is that Wendy is the VBAC 3C queen of basically from empowering moms and from improving birth in Abbotsford. She was the one that when moms came to us and said, I want to have a VBAC after two cesareans, I'd send them to Wendy and I'd say, well, this one had a VBAC after three cesareans in our health authority. So after you've decided that you're willing to travel and after you've realized that you really, really want this, like you want this bad, you just want to birth your baby vaginally and you're not going to let anybody stop you and you're not going to let anybody put fear into you. You're not going to listen to those fearful messages and you're going to stand strong. The next thing you need to do is you need to have support. Sometimes you're not going to be able to get that support from a care provider. Sometimes it's going to be you finding a way to stand in your power, even as your doctor is telling you, well, you can't do it. And you can say, well, guess what? I am not giving you permission to touch me. I'll call you when I need you. And I'm just going to birth because my body is already capable of it. And you're not getting paid to do a C-section. You're getting paid to support and facilitate my physiological birth. And if you can't do that, then you're fired. Because I can do this with any doctor on staff. I can go in pushing and I can do this with any doctor because I know that my baby is going to be born. It's not ideal. Unfortunately, this is what, where we're at. If you can't find anybody in your area and you're traveling and you can't find anybody, I mean, there are some mothers who have traveled great distances to find a care provider who will support a vaginal birth after multiple cesareans. That's just unfortunately the reality that we live in. And even if you're thinking, well, I want a midwife, um, sometimes the regulations and restrictions on midwifery kind of make it so that your midwife would love to support you. Absolutely, they believe in you, but they could lose their license. And that in itself puts fear into them and they're like, I'm sorry, I can't take you. It's not that it's dangerous and it's not that you can't do it. It's that they don't feel confident enough to actually stand against their system and their governing body in order to support you, just in case they get in trouble. Is it right? No. And it's also not what the midwife's uh, ethics really state. You're supposed to have that ability 
to make your own decisions. And the midwives are supposed to support that. But we also have the cultural influences. And again, if you're curious about learning more about that, reclaiming childbirth as a rite of passage. The bottom line is, this is your choice. If you want to try to have a vaginal birth after three cesareans, the only one really stopping you is you. Even if your care provider says no, even if your partner kind of feels iffy about it, even if your doula is like, mm, I don't know if I can do that. We'll find another doula, first of all, because they're not doing what their job is, which is to hold space for you so you can make your own decisions. And they're not giving you the support that you need. And even if your family and your friends are all thinking that you're crazy, the fact is, this is your choice. This is your birth. You're only going to get the chance to birth this baby once. And you're only going to have this body. This is your body. Do you want another surgery or do you want to attempt a vaginal birth and have a 79% chance of success? And remember, those numbers are based on hospital figures, not on physiological birth. So you could actually have a higher chance if you had a completely physiological birth, hands off, and even at home, you have a higher chance of success at home. And what I've seen in supporting clients is that yes, they do go into labor and they do have easier labors when they're at home rather than the hospital. And what I noticed when I was helping Rebecca was that she had a very uneventful vaginal birth after two cesareans it, at home. And by uneventful, I don't mean that it wasn't amazing to watch because it was, but there was no complications. There was nothing to worry about. There was no sensationalism. It was just really watching her go through the movements, take a nap, go through the movements again, have her partner give her some water, I mean, from a care provider standpoint, it's not the kind of birth that they would say, oh yeah, this was like really, really tough and, and I did all the things and I'm a hero. This is the, I watched and she did it and a baby came out. Um, and a lot of times there are doctors who get into the birth business because they like to do things. They don't like to watch. I, as a birth worker, I love to watch. I love to be in that space and see the power that my clients have in their own bodies. And I love to reinforce that power to them. That's, that's why I call the company Empowering Moms. Okay, so I think that's everything that I have today. My throat is getting a little dry and scratchy, um, still recovering. And if you did have a coerced cesarean or a co coerced induction and you're not happy about it or you're not happy about the way that you were treated, one thing I suggest highly recommended is that you file a complaint. Even if it doesn't go anywhere, even if it doesn't lead to a lawsuit, even if it's something that you're thinking, well, nobody's really going to do anything about this, it goes on their record. And that's something that I would really like to see happen more of because oftentimes when I say file a complaint letter, a lot of moms, they don't even know where to begin. Oftentimes the trauma is just so raw. There's just so much there. You feel overwhelmed. You feel like you just, it's just too much at that moment. Well, now we have a simple process and Jenny went through it and she did it so well. Keep empowering yourself, keep diving into the information. And if you do want to know more about the article that I discussed today, it's inside of the Facebook group already. And I will be posting that link in the chat. Okay, bye.